then I'll go tail down. I was gonna just pull us out of session as soon as David came back. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do we need a motion, David, to pull us out of executive session, or just we just say we're we're closing executive? I session? believe there is a motion to, to come out of executive session. Okay. So, so is there a motion to come out of executive session? I I so Thank you. Jane was uh, motioned, and then Mike Harper Road uh, seconded. Do we vote? Uh, All those in favor? Seeing that we're already out. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're out of, set, out of executive session, and I understand that there is a result. We saw um, two new board members, Jim Simmons and John Wong. Okay. Did you all hear? So we, Did you hear that, Doug? I could, thank you. Okay, so we, we can see the new yes. board of directors. Yes, let me go. Did you want you to sit as a... Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much, you. Kilar. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Maybe you would want to ask him to come and sit as a man. Yeah. As a guest. yeah. Oh, it's gone down. Yeah, yeah it did. Wow. So, we welcome. Thank you. Thank you. As official okay. board directors, you guys, you guys, you, you do everything. Yeah. Else. Sit over here. Sir. Yeah. And Dan can uh, sit down here. Or you can hurry up here. Sit here. Sit here. Sit here. Welcome, guys. Hello, Doug. Hi, Doug. Welcome. Now let the fun begin. <laughs> so, so, David, I'd like to make a motion to destroy the ballots. Is, is there a second? That's Jane. So, Steve Geisel's All those motion. In favor. Hi, all in favor. So I'll tell all you guys. Thank you. And I want to just say thank you very much to you, Tim, yeah, for managing the election process. And to, to Pam and Hilar as well. Yeah, I think they left. They left, but yeah. thank you. Thank them on our behalf. Yeah, Pam wants to go out to dinner. Well, that's a, a novel concept for 5 30. Yeah, anyway. Thank you all. Thank you. Now you can go cool down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tippy. Okay. So now that we can resume uh, our meeting uh, according to the agenda. And so the next item is the member open forum. And Lori, do we have any people signed up for the member forum? That's no, somebody in. We have one inside the room. Lori, any other people on Zoom? Not sure. Um, one second, okay. please. Okay. Okay, well, in the interest in time, in the interest of time exactly. So um, please introduce yourself again, and then you have three minutes uh, to make your statement. And it's just a statement to the board that we will listen to and uh, take into consideration. Um, so I am Steve Winters. I'm uh, a member of the Seasonal Neighborhood. These are also members, morning. My wife Becky and Marco. Uh, we met last night as a community. Uh, I heard things during the interview process that said 
and we want to do a premier resort community and we want to preserve value and quality of life. And in the Seattle <coughs> Residents Association covenants, it says, section 10.07, owners shall, that doesn't do you a little wrong, shall be responsible to maintain all sites, both developed and undeveloped, to clear unsightly weeds. I've asked uh, back on June the 7th, I asked David Franklin, emailed them, would you be willing to meet with some of the residents of the Sea Smoke development regarding the condition of our neighborhood? We've got three to four foot weeds in our neighborhood. It's not preserving value. It's not quality of life. This is not a premier resort community. I got handed off to Carol Ballard. I emailed her several times and they said, well, we've sent letters. No progress has been made. The weeds keep getting higher and it's becoming a fire hazard. We're headed for the dry period in the year. And if we have a fire, the whole neighborhood's gonna burn up. I've asked people to come and view the situation that we're dealing with. And I've gotten zero response. Are, excuse me, are these weeds that are on privately held lots? Yes, and, yeah. and the developer. Okay. And, and individual owned lots. Yes, okay. and I've asked people to come and view, see how bad the situation is. And I can't get anybody to come and look at our situation. It's not preserving value. And I can tell you, this is not a premier resort community. Even outside of the entrance, there's weeds. And you talked about the landscape committee working on all of the entrances to the different communities. Ours looks terrible. Embarrassing. It's embarrassing, it's shocking. I moved to Simiamu because I thought we were gonna be moving to a gated community that had high standards for landscaping. And my question is, it's in the covenants, the Semiamu, when are you gonna enforce the covenants? There's a whole section in there about enforcement. Nothing is being done about enforcement. Okay. Steve, do you wanna address, address that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, first of all, there is a sea smoke community uh, na uh, neighborhood homeowners association. Yes, that, that should be responsible for should have the first line responsibility for making sure that these things are taken care of. In the current state of development of sea smoke, that association is under the control of the developer. Um, he has been contacted multiple times. Uh, about the lots that changed hands and where construction start dates have been missed and so on. We've had exactly pretty much the same experience trying to get in touch with these people uh, as, as the residents have had. Uh, it's been very difficult to get responses. Uh, we are, we actually need to bring the uh, question of what the SRA does when a neighborhood association is not meeting its responsibility. There isn't an established procedure for that, but there needs to be, and, and we do need to, to take that up at the board level because we, we have it in other places too. I'd be interested to hear. So in the Sea Smoke Development Covenants, it says the Sea Smoke lots and residents are part and subject of the Simiama Resort Association and the Simiama Resort Community Declarations. So we fall under the SRA covenants. 
And then in section 11.04, which talks about enforcement of the SRA covenant, there's a whole section about enforcement and nothing is being done about enforcement of the SRA covenants. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I hate to disagree, but actually they have all gotten their first, their first violation letters about this. And you feel the court is days, that 1104 days allow us to take action immediately. It re days requires that we give them time to respond. They have reached that point. We're meeting tomorrow to discuss that. We can then bring it forward to the board, but we're, we're following 1104. Oh, it's well beyond 14 days. This should have been addressed when the weeds were six inches tall. Now they're four feet tall. Uh, our, well, when you yeah. get into debate about that, that's not what our undeveloped lot um, standard says, not it four says inches. Right here, owners shall be responsible to maintain all sites, both developed and undeveloped, to clear unsightly weeds. That's right out of your covenants. That's not our lots undeveloped lot standard, though. So we have a conflict. Okay, if we have a fire in our development, there's a liability by the SRA board of directors. Okay, I would suggest that this issue be discussed on a separate, in a separate meeting um, so that we can actually continue with the, this meeting at, at hand. The, the, meet, the open forum is a 15 minute uh, session. And so I think to better uh, address the issue, we would have to take it off offline in the summer time. That's fine. And it will be addressed. We as a community, our next step is you're going to be talking to our attorney. I would like to add one little thing in this not long. Uh, I talked to Wade and he says they're putting a new sign over there. And I said, is it going to be like the Semiyama sign? He said, no. Why not? We are part of Semiyama, aren't we? I mean, we are being treated like a second class citizen. Well, the sign has to be approved by ASC, I would imagine. Isn't that right, Steve? I mean, yeah. see, smoke cannot put up any sign that they want. It has to be adhered to the standards for the sign. It's going to be so, yeah. but it is too, so. <laughs> Like anything else, they need to come with a yeah. proposal and a, a permit. They have to get a permit from, from SRA. So. We, we, that will be addressed. And Steve, you said that the committee is addressing this tomorrow at ASC. Is the 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 violation violation? The, yes. You know, it's a bunch of violations, but they they find they pass their after promising that they would clean up and start by the tenth. They they pass that date, and this is the first meeting after after not meeting their obligation. So we're going to take it up. And those are the builders, but there are also private owners of lots, and those need to be addressed as well. Well, we can, um, I, I will have some time to meet with any of you tomorrow if that's the, we can try to address the issue. Let's see what happens after. Steve, the ASC meeting's at 8 30. Yep. And so sometime after that, if any of you have some time, you can we can meet and we can discuss what ASC has uh, what's come out of that meeting, and then so my email address. I'd be glad to meet with you. Absolutely. So yeah. probably ten to probably somewhere after. It's hard to say when they're meeting, and so ten thirty to twelve thirty somewhere in there. If you have if you have some flexibility and time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lori, do we have any other uh, speakers interested in the open forum? I have not received any messages from anybody indicating they wish to speak in open forum. Okay, so with that, um, let's move to the next agenda item, which is uh, uh, Matt, maybe you could give us a quick update on the resort and golf course. I don't see Jeff uh, today. Yeah, just me today. Uh, good after, good evening now. <laughs> um, quick update for the resort. Big one, I think that certain individuals in a blue shirt on the end of the table will be very happy about is we are officially have a spot to get around the spit. That has been obviously with the pier 
being uh, essentially uh, condemned, uh, we were not, we had to close part of it. So now there is a, call it a walkway gangplank that gets you from uh, one part of the spit around to the Packers peering around. So uh, that has been a big part for the community. I've heard a lot of feedback on that. Uh, owners ponied up, we did a quick fix. There will be a several million dollar investment over the next couple of years to figure out the long-term project process of the pier. But again, quick fix, uh, we're at least have access and granted access around the spit. So it, it uh, works really well, Matt. That's great. Great job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was a big piece for a lot. I mean, a lot of our homeowners walk that every day. Um, and there was some feedback about it, but you know, we couldn't control storms and the, uh, how old that pier was. So, uh, ownership did allow a small fund to get a quick fix of it. Uh, other than that, the renovation is almost end of completion and we will start getting the property back up to our standards, you know, with our gravel driveways and such. So you'll see less trucks in and out. Um, other than that, you know, I know Jeff would love to say, hey, sunning's out, please play some golf. <laughs> So we finally got uh, sun golf courses in great shape, and uh, that's about it. Matt, I have I have one one quick question. Since you're down there, you just talked about gravel driveways. Um, I think it's under the control of the marina, but it looks like after they knock the building down, and maybe David, you know what this is. They they put a gravel kind of really ugly looking gravel parking lot. I'm not sure what it is. Is that Matt, are you aware? Is that that's what it is. That's, that's that's what they're going with. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't even think he owns that property yet, right, David? I I thought that it was <laughs> under contract and yeah, that maybe it hadn't contract. transferred yet. But uh, from what I understood from the leadership meeting is it was going to remain a parking lot. Gravel, hacky, gravel, ugly. Yeah, Doug, they, Doug, that's Doug. Maybe that's something that needs to go on the conversation list. Yeah, I think so. The question I would have is uh, with Steve too is, uh, um, you know, ASC have any input over what is being done there? Good question. No well, idea. And that was developer and it's still developer owned at this point, correct? I believe it is. Yeah. is From it? what I you know, living down there and the chatter that I get, it's still, um, isn't it Weiss? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, I thought that from what Matt or what Tom was saying that that was, they were planning on purchasing that. And that they it, are, it's, it's just, they have not yet. They haven't yeah, yet. Yeah, I okay. think there were conditions to close and one of them was to remove that house or the, the office building there. And, and okay. so I guess that's, now the question becomes, is that an acceptable surface? Is that parking lot done according to our ASC standards? Yeah, no. It's permeable. So it is permeable. Yeah. I don't I don't know what was worse, the old building or the what's there now. So well, that's something we can bring up and see if we can get some answers to everybody at the next yep. uh, council meeting to talk to um, to Tom about that, what the plans are and where they are in the process and what the future holds for that site. Yeah, and, and Steve, I don't know, maybe somebody on the ASC could just give a, uh, um, a, a question to us as it relates to the specifics of the corner landscaping, you know, uh, do we or do parking lots need to be in any way um, landscaped to a certain standard? I mean, it 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 needs to, in my opinion, match so that it fits in with the uh, the hotels landscaping and stuff. So, it seems to me ASC um, should have something to say about it. I don't even know which neighborhood association we're working with. It, I don't know that there is a neighborhood association, yeah. but the but the marina is part of SRA. Well, I would think it'd be an undeveloped lot 
I thought the Marina well, was not part of S SRA, that it had an option and it didn't exercise that option originally. So, and then what does it mean by the Marina? Is it just the slips or any no, th property they buy? The, the slip owners have an option not to participate, but, uh, but in the CCNRs, it's my opinion in reading these CCNRs that it relates to the Marina and commercial properties. And to me that- okay. <laughs> that would that would be it. Well, okay. Leave it as a follow-up item. Yep. Um, so, so what is the process for clarifying all this, so that we know if we're supposed to be doing something or not? I guess the question is, what what is the role of ASC as it relates to oversight for the uh, uh, parking lot landscaping, the surface? Yeah. It, I mean, th that area is not on any of the maps that we have that say we're responsible for it. We have no record. I, I know of no record of, of any CCNRs for that, that area of development. I, I, so I, I would just, my, that's my question. My question is how do we establish whether we are, whether they are responsible to us to follow the SRA CCNRs? Steve, isn't it a part of the master plan, though, the Simiyama Resort master plan? And that, I think yeah. that's a part of it. Yeah. Like how that spins. And the covenant should tell us, as though we've had this discussion before, where they are in full force. I and mean, you cannot enforce the covenants outside the bounds of where they have been determined by whatever has been deeded. Right, those should all be that the covenants run with the land. So wherever they they're not they're not part of that uh, title of that property, then we don't have any. We should not have any authority there. Of course. So I'll ask Tom if uh, they have a title report and whether or not it's subject to SRA. But also even more broadly, just what are their plans for that? Right, because if they, I know they need more parking. That's fine. But a nice parking lot, nicely landscaped parking lot, I think that would be fun. At the meeting, Tom spent a little, quite a bit of time talking about their need for in the summertime for parking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the ultimate service is going to be. But we'll find out. Okay. So, any other updates? Uh, is that it, Matt? Yep. No, that's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, Buzz was saying check, uh, it's basically the same thing, yeah. you know, check the master plan, check. Uh, okay, so next on the agenda is the treasurer's report. Dave? Um, you know, well, I can't see it. So, uh, Lori, can you move the uh, agenda to the treasurer's report? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be quite a ways there. Hopefully everybody read all of that stuff in the mm -hmm. consent agenda. That was... There's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to ask Steve what the, uh, in the, uh, while we're running to that, just what those low toners were in the uh, um, ASC notes. <laughs> what the what? The low toners. <laughs> there was, it was, your, when, when you were going through it, I think they, they combined lot owners and the, through the whole document, it was, instead of lot owners it was a, a run-on word so it was low toners <laughs> oh no well. i just thought it was funny anyway okay well um i mean the the uh long and the short here is that we're um i believe still tracking very well both the uh operating budget and maintenance and in uh, admin um and as well as our reserve budget um I think uh, you know there's a number of things that that helped. I think we we got some wind behind our back by not having some uh, some staff here for quite a while uh, on the admin side. Uh, there are some variances here, and you know the notes um, explain some of those. I was asking Carol about it too, Steve. One of the biggest ones in in income is uh, ASC fees, and why you can see. Um, you know we're only at seventeen percent of what we budgeted, and and so apparently a lot of this because this office is busy I mean, every time you know i mean it's the busiest office here and carol was explaining to me that that a lot of of, of the activity is the result of of uh of permitting fees and applications that were processed in 2020 and 2021 
So yeah. very interesting that we haven't seen the income, even though we're seeing the activity, we're not seeing an associated income, which I think what was budgeted for us before I got here. So it was kind of well, a, a surprise to me. But if the fees were processed in 20 and 21, we got that income then. And that's what I'm saying. So you can see that at, with only $5,000 in income, but we're expecting 26,000, but that office is continually busy and people in and out and in and out. But, but I, think money. We, I think we knew that. And these were for, weren't, weren't these, Steve, for new starts that we knew yeah. were coming online? I would. Yeah, and, and we just discussed about six new starts that are in Sea Smoke, which has a very small middle fee that doesn't change with time, and that the, those people have been recalcitrant. I, I, how many of those still need to pay a fee or as opposed to already having been approved? We've had one sea smoke building where they applied and then when they found out that they had to follow the our rules, they have withdrawn before they before they actually submitted the, the thing. so we so that that. Will be okay. um, so maybe we'll be seeing some increases in that uh, particular line item over the next few months, uh, but it was just one that kind of stood out. Um, and also you'll see the 391% of budget on security. That's all about gates, um, you know, and this is for year to date, what we have budgeted 5,000 for gate um, repairs and, and maintenance, and we're at 19,000. Some of that will be, and, and I have to it just need the time, to the, some of that's going to be transferred most likely to capital because those are some capital improvements. They've just been um, classified here under operating and they'll be reclassed. But um, just but to let you know, there has been, and you probably have noticed that there was a lot of uh, time spanning gates this year. Um, Lori, can you move to the next page? So that's just year to date. This is for forecasts compared to the plan. And um, You've got some ups and downs here, uh, but for the most part, as I mentioned, you know we we are, we're looking at uh, a surplus of 100 or twelve thousand dollars. I think we'll be closer to 104 once transfers are are um, uh, made between uh, operating and capital. The gate, what I was just talking about, would be a perfect example of that money that's been spent on the operating side or classified in the original budget that we've identified really as you know, more longer term capital improvements on, on some of the, um, uh, some of these categories here. So, um, yeah, I, I think that in, in all, I mean, we're, we're almost six months halfway through the year. Um, I see the budgets holding up well as um, the ones that were ratified by the members. Um, you know, there will obviously be some, some items over and some under, but um, overall, I think we're gonna be good for the end of the year. Um, with that, um, budgeting is starting in earnest right now. Um, we've gotten, uh, I think, fully staffed here in the uh, admin side, so that's hopefully going to free me up a little bit to concentrate on both the operating and reserve budgets. Uh, there has been a lot of work going on this last month uh, with uh, Dan um, Rudolph, myself, and a huge debt of gratitude to uh, Dave Whitmore for all of the help that he has provided on um, putting together, I think, a very comprehensive uh, capital improvement a plan that is going to be the basis of the reserve study. I just sent that out um, on Monday. Uh, we have been working on that over the last couple of weeks, so that has been received by uh, the reserve analyst, hopefully in two weeks, we should have a draft reserve, um, a new reserve study. Um, I can say just by looking at that and because we updated um, the component list, which was lacking, we updated the um, useful life of each one of those components, which we didn't think was realistic in the original reserve study, and we updated the uh, replacement costs or per unit costs. <laughs> All of those looking as if we will need an increase in the capital reserve assessment, which I don't think is going to come as a surprise to anybody. Um, and so that, so that just went out the door. That's a big chunk of the capital um, planning. And then Dan and I are working on and just um, started to hog some time out to start working on the maintenance budget and the admin budget. And so uh, with a new treasurer, 
Uh, I hope. <laughs> I don't know what well, time I'm hoping. We haven't done that, <laughs> so we haven't done that part yet. But, but uh, yeah, that, that's going to be something where we can fire back up the uh, the finance committee and, and actually start working with the rest of the committees to look at what our needs are for next year. Steve Haynes and I have been talking and we've met a few times and discussed what ASC needs. And so there's some changes there we're going to be proposing. Um, and so we'd like to be able to get to, together with all of the committees very soon to look at their needs. Yeah, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, so, so when we finally finish the reserve study, mm -hmm. because it's so fundamental to the future of, of the SRA, this shouldn't be something that's buried in a consent agenda or anything. I think we need to have a presentation to the board. Oh, yeah. Have, you know, Dave wants to be part of that. Whoever's doing the reserve, whoever officially is doing the reserve study yourself and walk everyone through that analysis because it's really enlightening. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so you'll get a draft. You'll, there'll be a draft. It's not going to be a fait accompli when we get it in a couple of weeks. We're going to be able to mash that around. It's going to be discussed. We, it's also going to be very important that the community gets an introduction to it. And we've reached a point where we should be scheduling just to get it on the schedule, a series of informational meetings with the community town halls to, um, so that we're ready for the AGM. I believe those are supposed to be in August, Steve, as, as according to the budget schedule that the Finance Committee, I believe, put together either in 2020 or 2021. So those will need to be scheduled. They're on the, you know, the, they're on the radar, um, and those will need to be put, um, communicated out to the com community and put on a, a calendar. What's the communication? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what the heck have you done? prime vacation time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask, because uh, last year, I know we actually had a session, a work, working session, where we, we all came together, we discussed budget for, for the budget preparation. So uh, I think that's something we should probably do this year as well. Almost definitely. Um, and it's now the end of June. And so I think it needs to happen like in the next week or two, probably. Well, that's what hopefully Dan and I can get, you know, working together uh, this next week, probably this weekend, um, to try to get a draft together. Uh, that's going to be, I think, for, in my opinion, it is better for us to have a draft, something to a straw man for instead of starting at zero. That, that's just, I mean, and I'll, I'll take direction from the board, however they want, want to do this, but it, it seems to me that to have some numbers to beat up is better than just some zeros in a column. Well, I mean, you it, could look it, at it here. We, go ahead, Doug. Uh, I was just going to say, and as we start to look at next year, we need to be start looking at the same time on a 10-year horizon. So as we say, well, this is what it's going to be for this line item this year, but Let's also talk about what it's going to be for the next five to 10 years so that we can start to fill in that uh, long term uh, financial plan. Well, and that's what I, and I and I know that's one of the goals that you've set. And so trying to build the current budget worksheet so that we can get this year and then have that feed into a a basically a compilation sheet that we can then apply inflation factors to or whatever we may want to, to you know, augment in the future. But so, and so I, I, that's the part I need to work on, you know, conceptually, um, how do I take what the information we have, the current budget model that we have, and then build that out. And I don't think it's gonna be that difficult, but it just, we want to be able, when we change numbers in this year's budget we want it to be informing those future years in that in that spreadsheet so that's what i that's what i'm, I'm going to be working on no i would just say too i was just going to say before doug uh that yeah having a as you call it a straw man or a sort of a draft is is ideal in some respects in other respects you're sort of doing the work and then there may be priorities and things that we have um so I think it should be sort of a congruent process where we're we're all discussing the issues, and I think it needs to be done sooner rather than later. Um, and I would actually advocate for having the finance committee uh, at the table. 
I would say that's a good way. Yeah. I used to do finance committee meetings, board meetings, finance committee, board meetings, and it, I'd do like eight meetings a year just to get a budget put together. And that's just not productive. And I would more than I would I would support having everybody in the room as much as you know, too many people. It gets really hard. But yes, I would appreciate having. So that. I would I would just move. To to try and have that done sooner rather than later, and everyone's busy and all that, but that's just a priority for us. We have a time schedule that we need to follow. Do we have a set of objectives for this budget? Well, well, part of the budget. Are, we, are we doing a budget uh, just to maintain a status quo or to catch up for uh, unfunded and, or deferred maintenance, or are we looking at are we looking at any? Uh, Investments in the committee on top of that. Well, there were John last year. There we had a a set of objectives that was employed um, and developed through the budgeting cycle, and and I think that that's a, an excellent question and a good point. I think it's it's really important that as we start out, we need to have those uh, objectives in front of us. And and I would also add that's where I think. The reserve study, the real reserve study. In the past, we did, you know, nothing. Little five hundred dollar reserve studies that really just checked an auditing box. Okay. This is a real reserve study that goes out over ten, what, how many years? Thirty years? Thirty, 30 years. Thirty years with real numbers, the best best numbers we can put in there. Okay. So I think that is going to have a big impact on the budget we put together. I think what John is talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong. You were talking about one of the goals that you had was a census. And so what you're talking about is a community survey. And what you're really talking about is what is the community wanting Semyon to be in essence? I mean, <clears throat> here's the leadership, but, you know, what, what is it that the folks here in Semyon want? And you don't really know. You, like you mentioned, we don't even know really who Semyon is. And until you know that, I mean, as far as the longer term goals, that's that's what you really need to do to be able to make sure that the decisions we're making in here match what the community wants and their vision. We don't have that. I don't think we have that at all. But in the meantime, we've got to get by 2023. I think what but, we need but to let do me interrupt, David. Let me interrupt just a second, because um, uh, what we did when we had our planning meeting is we said, well, look, at, we don't have the uh, capacity this year to really get in and do what we would call the community plan and do the census that we needed to do in order to make that community plan. But we did put it on our agenda so that that community plan would be kicked off in the first quarter of next year. Was that not correct? It was 2023. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's what. But you're already in the budget year for. I mean, so when you're going to see a, a a budget affected by the community plan would be 2024. Four, exactly. I think to be realistic, where we are in terms of the calendar, this is July for all intents and purposes. And to do a community uh, survey now is. Oh, no, we really can't do it. That's what I'm, I'm just saying. saying. So yeah. what I'm proposing that we do is we have a meeting and we discuss put the objectives that John I think is is talking about. Um, and it's deferred maintenance. It's it's all of these aesthetics. It's uh, you know crisis issues and so on um, that we need to make sure in the budget um, and change for 2023. The the census that we do in the first quarter of 2023 will be for budget 24. Absolutely. Let's be realistic. Yeah. No, I'm right there with you. Okay. Yeah, I think I, we need to keep the meeting yeah, uh, so on schedule. So. so um, as far as uh, budget's concerned, you know, that just kind of came out of financials. Um, that's, you know, our, our capital budget. Uh, if you could move to the next page, Lori. So forecast of plan is really good. Um, we're, uh, we're doing well. You can see uh, actual column versus what's budgeted. We still got a ways to go in, in all of the uh, uh, categories there. And that just kind of shows you that we're just in the beginning of the capital uh, project season. There'll be a lot more going on. Dan and his crew is working uh, very hard, and uh, we're, you're going to see a lot of improvements in Semiamu between now and September. That's all I can say. So, you know, stay tuned. There's going to be, you'll see those numbers fill up under in that blue, uh, or excuse me, in the yellow column there as we get into the summer. 
So that's it for the budget or finance report, unless anybody has any questions. No? Okay. Yeah. And let's move on then to committee reports. Is that where we are? Yeah. Janet in front of you. Yep. Committee okay. reports. Uh, so first up is the communications. Yeah. Uh, so the committee. Yeah. Right there. Thanks, Lori, for pulling that up. Um, so we we talked about it at the last. I, I mentioned that the communications committee at our last board meeting was working on a position statement regarding development in general. I know we we um, we now have a statement out there on the eight lots um, up at Sea Smoke. But this is this is a broader. This is regarding all future developments. I think it's a terrific piece of work. The communications committee did a lot of work on this. It's several board members had input, making some environmental changes. committee, uh, environmental committee, and we yeah. also had um, uh, we also had a perfect. Doug, how would you categorize Brian? What what would you? Uh, he's a um, uh, senior partner. Was a retired senior partner from one of the major architectural firms and. In uh, Seattle, lots of land use development expertise. Uh, yeah. So what he's done is, uh, on he he gave background on both the petition and helped us with this, and also he wrote um, uh, a piece on track D uh, for Sea Smoke, and yeah. um, that went to the city last Friday. Yeah. So. As you take a look at this statement, I think it's really important our voice is heard and heard quickly, immediately. Um, John, you talked about being an activist board. You know, I've been on the board now two years, and this is one of the more sort of activist positions we've taken, but I think it's needed because if this goes wrong, we're talking about the future development, this will wreck home. This will do the exact opposite of what our mission statement says, right? So future development, whether it's SRA or not, in most cases, it's not SRA uh, developments, but they impact us in a huge way. We've got to have our voice heard. We need to have our voice heard. So I'd like to, to you know, we've had a lot of input in this, and I'd like to, to vote on this and and get approval to make this our official statement. Now, Jane had some great questions, right? Is what are we going to do with this? And I think that we need to have that discussion. What's the plan with this statement? Obviously, I think it goes to our members, but who else does this go to? What are we doing with this statement? Yeah, well, one of my questions was, um, what do we hope to accomplish by having this? And then um, who specifically is the audience here? Is that so it's it's pointed to, is it just broad? I I, I was wondering about that. And then um, and then how do we execute it? Well, so the, the very recent and what looked to me like precipitous approval of Mr. Schwann's request for a variance from the requirements in creating the stormwater report for Semiamu Highlands is an example of something that we needed to respond immediately to. Um, and having this guidance to support that may, makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think Jane's right, it becomes we need we need a rapid action plan to respond to things like that that come up unexpectedly uh, and where you can't get you know the whole board together and, and that sort of thing to implement the the sense of this statement. Hey, hey Steve, just I think you were copying on it, but um, uh, the letter that uh, Brian Berg put together that went out on behalf of SRA. Uh, that addressed the um, semi Imo Highlands request for variance. And um, he went through the city regulations, went through their application proposal yeah. and determined where the differences were. And right. that letter went to the city. Okay, I, 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 that's the piece I didn't get was that it actually had turned into a, a letter from what was it from then from the SRA? Yeah, from SRA. 
Yeah. But I think that's it, that's well put. That's how it's, we implement. This is the global statement of which now when there's little tactical issues that we need to deal with related to future developments, we this centers us. We can come back to the statement and say, aha, this is what we believe. And therefore, what you're proposing here violates that, and we can get into the details of whatever it is they're violating. But, but aren't you asking specifically with regard to that letter, where does it go? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. And now that we've done this, you know, what is... Is it in the city of Blaine's hands or whoever, where it should you know, Whatcom County, you know, office? The other question I had is, are we coordinating with, say, Birch Bay Village uh, HOA? Uh, and what other HOAs in the in the area are we coordinating with? Because power in numbers, and at the meetings we've had on Semiama Highlands and Inverness and some of these and Horizon, and Birch Bay Village has been more vocal than Semiamo because obviously water goes downhill. Um, so that's what I think we need to have is maybe there's a subcommittee or I don't want to bureaucratize that we have a little group of people that actually ensures that there's maximum coordination between all of us, I, interested I think, parties. I think, uh, um, Jeff, that there is what you would consider a, um, a task force that has really kind of emerged that includes Brian and April and um, I believe Buzz and um, uh, Mike. Mike is on there, Steve was involved. Uh, that kind of that first of petition group. And they've done a little bit more work and stuff. And I think what we should do is, is allow that, that group to really be a recognized task force on behalf of uh, the Semiamu uh, Residents Association. That's kind fine. Of, yeah, just so we have, a, so it doesn't fall into a black hole. And, exactly. You know, and it's shepherded all the way to the final office desk uh, inbox sort of thing, because I'm not sure it's very, Jennifer is very knowledgeable about it. Um, and so she would be a good resource to have involved. I don't mean to volunteer, but she's just super, you know, when we have the environmental committee meetings, very helpful with all the details. <clears throat> Sorry, Jennifer. But what, what I think we should do tonight is vote on this. We should approve this. We have it now on record. We still need to determine exactly where it goes and that's where other people can help us determine where that goes i'd love to have first of all it should go to our members i thought i, I thought it served us really well to send out the position what, what the petition statement on the eight lots at seasmark i had a lot of positive feedback like yeah right on um i think this will have that same type of reaction from the yeah, i'd love to see this posted as a, almost a letter to the editor in the Northern Light, right? I, I, this needs to be a, this is our position on future development. And then it, you know, I don't know all the different points. Are we sending it to this person in public works or this person in the development office in Blaine and Whatcom County and all the other- Well, that's the task force. So I think right. we asked the task force to, to manage that. Yeah. Good. So is there a motion uh, on the floor to uh, adopt this, to approve this letter? I'll motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion. Doug is the uh, motion uh, maker and Mike Harper is the second. Is there a, a do we have a, a, can we have a vote please? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? So we have a unanimous a vote. In favor. Thank you. And then I think that the, the follow on would be that we would um, reach out to the maybe the communications committee could reach out to this task force and Buzz and April and the others, Mike and so on, um, and see if we could uh, work with them to help shepherd this process forward to the appropriate desk inbox. Absolutely. Okay. Any other thing from the communications committee? Okay, Steve. Well, and going back just for clarification, is it going to go out to the community or is that is the task force going to determine that, Jen? Um, 
or is that a communications committee decision? Yeah, let's just let the communications committee uh, meet with the task force. They'll cut, drop a list of the places that it's going to go, and it'll come back, and and it'll be uh, uh, pushed out by your office, David. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Steve, over to you, ASC. Okay. There are five things. This doesn't have to take long. The first three are um, revisions or updates to existing uh, procedures and procedure and policy. We, there is no formal instruction to the ASC as to what needs to come to the board for approval or, whether, or what things should just be sent for information and so on. The committee's in a conservative position when we change the standards, for example, we came to the board for approval. Uh, if, if after doing these three things, you say you don't have to bring them to us, just send us for approval, fine. But we did update the signage rules. They, they were in the standards. They were moved out as a separate document because they several standards referred to them. And we had two requests from neighborhood associations whose main gate is inside the, the um, perimeter. So you have to go through, it's a second gate that you have to go through to get into there, that they wanted to use signage that was different from the standard post signs that everything, every, every that most of the neighborhoods have. The committee discussed it and concluded that all the signs that face public roads should be, should follow similar design, follow the existing design, and that the maintenance department maintains that design standard and so on. But inside the gates, uh, if a neighborhood wanted to use something different, that that would be okay, but it would need to be approved. Um, the two are Clubhouse Point and St. Andrew's Cottages. They both want to use a large rock with the entrance sign lettering on it. Seem, the committee is quite comfortable with that um, as long as it's inside the gates. So the, that document is updated as to stand alone as an independent document and the and the change is clarifying the design standards for exterior facing versus interior neighborhood gate. I would uh, I, I would move approval of the revised signage document. Is there a second? Second. Jane. So Jane is seconded. Is there any discussion? Any further discussion? Remember anyone? I just I'll just have one question. I'll, I'll place to to John, and, and that is John as it relates to kind of the concept we've discussed about kind of the branding and in our signage and stuff. Uh, do you see any conflict with having different signages on the uh, the condominium projects that are inside the gates? of uh, causing any kind of a, a confusion or branding issue? Not at this point, no. Okay. Any other further comments or questions? So let's call a vote. All those in favor of the updated signage? Any opposed? Okay, so we have unanimous consent. Steve, second. Okay, the next are the are newly proposed standards for maintenance of developed lots. Uh, although, uh, as was pointed out, there is the statement that lot developed lots must be maintained. There are no standards. There have not been since the founding of Semiamu. And that puts us in very, an impossible situation in terms of enforcement. So we have created this document to talk about um, standards. We talked in detail about whether you had standards that were like, your lawn can't be more than three inches high and that sort of thing, and, and, and moved away from that as much as, as we could. That basically there are general statements 
about tightly weeds, disease of dangerous trees, undergrowth, that sort of thing. The only actual height limitations have to do with roads and clearance uh, uh, of trees and that sort of thing. We ran into a very, uh, uh, an interesting problem which needs needed to be addressed, which is that there are lots along the shore, both in Boundary Ridge, in Drayton Cove and Drayton Hillsides that have portions of the lot that are not buildable because of the slope. And it seemed inappropriate to apply the standard for maintain for developed lots to a portion of a lot that can't be developed. And so we have included that special circumstance that the owner can declare or ask for us to declare a portion of their lot that's unde undevelopable that would be managed under the standards for undeveloped lots. And the rest of the lot would be would have the standards for developed lots applied. Um, and we have one active, uh, we actually have one active request for action under uh, in that situation. Um, so this is this is the first time there will be an official standard that can be enforced. I'm sure that in the first year we'll have changes that we want to make, but uh, it seems very timely since we're since we're under threat of lawsuit for uh, not ma uh, maintaining these standards that we we actually have a standard that, that we can work with. So I move approval of this document with the correction of the Scrivener's errors that have been identified. Second. Is there a second? Steve? Uh, any further discussion? Okay, since there's no further discussion, we'll call a vote. All those in favor? On. All those opposed? So we have unanimous consent. Good work, Steve. Excellent. Nice, nice job. Okay, third point. Now we're moving into uh, the problem of exterior alterations. The CCNRs require that any exterior alteration, including to the land, uh, be approved by the ASC. It gets very confusing between, you know, an exterior alteration can be anything from replacing, from adding. Um, 50% more to the house, all the way down to painting it. And so we just, we figured that the best way to do this was actually by simply having different forms for different circumstances. Um, they are, are the first one in the packet was a, a variance request. We thought it was important uh, where, where someone is requesting a variance from the CCNRs, that that be treated differently than any other kind of request because it's a significant change. It's, a, it's, a, it's just an important decision and being able to justify it and be able to refer back to it if a similar request comes in the future and so on seems important. And we've had, we've had to send back requests because they they actually were variance requests and they and the person submitting the request didn't even realize it was a variant a, a variance from a fixed rule. So we have a variance request form that basically says you need to have exceptional reasons for uh, for doing this. An exterior addition or demolition request form, if you want to add square footage or subtract square footage from a building, and the reason for making that separate is that some of those projects are quite large and actually should be reviewed by the construction compliance consultant. And that should incur a submittal fee, but we haven't, we've, we have had a standard $250 submittal fee for any remodeling, no matter how small or how, how large, which makes no sense. So this is for large changes. And then we have, well, they're not in very good order, an exterior alteration request for small changes. 
I want to replace these three windows. Uh, I want to remove this one window and, and put siding up there and make the wall solid. That kind of, that kind of change which doesn't get a submittal fee because it doesn't require nearly as much work. We have a temporary structure notification. This is, again, a, it's a separate category. These are the inflatable playgrounds you wanna put out for your grandchildren because they're coming for a week and nobody wants them permanent, but Wait. They, they get complaints when they go up. So we want to be notified and make sure they go go down. These are for wedding tents, uh, that kind of that kind of thing. That is a noticeable uh, event. It is actually not allowed in the CCNRs, except with ASC approval. And this would help us keep keep track of those. And. Then there's the replacement notification. Things like repainting with, the, with a color that's on the approved list, roof replacements with roofing material that's on the approved list, stuff that doesn't actually require approval in the CCNRs, but it does require notification. So it's different than the other ones. And this makes it clear that it's a replacement notification and that will get staff approved. It doesn't need to wait for the next meeting. So that's an efficiency uh, thing. So this is basically cleaning up the process. We're not changing any rules. We're just making it easier for the, for the members to send the right information in the first time. So this is what, I think this is a good example of whether we need to bring this to the board, these kind of things to the board for approval at all or not, or if you just want uh, something that goes comes in for your information that goes on the consent agenda or something like that. I, I, we just don't have any guidance about when to ask for approval and when not. But I'll move the, that these five forms be accepted. All right, is there a second? I'll second. James seconds. Any further discussion? Seems nice work to me. <laughs> Okay, well then I guess what I'll do sometime is come back with a with a guidance document, a, a paragraph, a document that says when we need to get approval and when we can just send it in for information. Okay, um, well we'll just do a vote since we did have a motion and a second. So all those in favor, all those opposed. So we have you. consent. Thank you very much. All right, now I've got unfortunately two things that require decisions. Um, and the first is the split rail fence along Samyamu Drive and Parkway that, that sits on the private property of lot owners in Boundary Estates and Boundary Ridge 2. It's ugly. It's poorly maintained. We get many complaints about it. We've delved deeply into its history and we are not going to be able to get in, a in any reasonable amount of time a clear understanding of who put it up under what authority. We believe, and it's probably a good guess, that um, it was put up by the developer early in the process and that just never got documented and no, uh, no responsibility for maintenance was ever assigned that we can find. So we need to do something about it. And as the thing says, it's complicated because it sits on private property. <clears throat> the options are listed in the document. One, we could deny responsibility, but require the individual owners to maintain the portion of fence that's on their lot could require that it be removed. Um, one. Two, we could assign responsibility for the fence and its maintenance to Boundary Estates and Boundary Ridge Two Homeowners Association. And 
they could maintain it or remove it uh, at their discretion. Once they figured out if they can do that when it's on individual <laughs> people's property. Or three, we could assume responsibility for the fence and its maintenance and decide that we will maintain it, that it, is, it violates the CCR's prohibition on perimeter fencing and it should be removed. Um, or we could take it to the AGM for a, for a community vote and whether they want it to be an SRA maintained amenity uh, to maintain the look and feel of, of Semiamu. But we need a decision. We do something about it. Steve, what road is that? <laughs> Steve, I have a question for you. Actually, I'm new to the community, but this is one thing that stood out to me like immediately when I got here, how ugly that is. What what is what is this group in the SRA think about that? In other words, what would you like to see happen at the end of the day, regardless of who does it? And I ask that because if you have a if we or you have a specific objective, but you know that you would like to see happen, trying to push it down and leave it to individual, it's just not going to happen. I don't think. Um, and so, in that case, it seems like it would be almost better if SRA took over and put it in the shape if they wanted to be either take it out, rebuild it, replace it, whatever. But but starts with what. If there's energy here about what that should look like, one way or the other, other than they don't like it, that it looks out of the end. The one thing that I notice about the split rail fence is that it's mimicked throughout the you know the overall development. So you see it on you know the, the corner there, and then if you go down to the spit, you see it you know against so the semi-amid the shore. Yeah. Yeah. Trees. yeah. yeah. But that's also up on Drayton Hillside. There's a split rail fence in there. And, and I think that there might be in a couple other well, places. Yeah, you know, there's one on Drayton that's sent at the dead end of Snowy Owl that's just been repaired recently. Yeah. There's one up by the fire up by Carnoustie where the fire road is. Mm -hmm. So that your light is throughout the community. So I've kind of seen it. I know that there is, you know, um, Fencing is not really part of our CCNRs, but in light of it, I I think that you make a good point, Jim. Is like, what do we really want to see? And and my thought is, I don't think that a split rail fence is that expensive, and maybe it would be within the SRA to just take care of it. Who maintains semi on shores? actually Simeon Shore Homeowners Association. So that's one of the things you'll constantly hear yeah. moving forward is equity. You know, yeah. if we're gonna do split rail fences, do we do split rail fences? If SRI takes on that responsibility, shouldn't that be for everybody or? So, so I, I, I agree with you, Jim, that the handing it to individual homeowners is, that's, that'll be a disaster. And it'll cost more time pushing individual owners than it's worth. But I do think, and Boundary Ridge, from what I understand, has a functioning, a yeah. well-functioning HOA. Yeah. We could hand it to them, and uh, you Ridge know, does. What, what's that? States doesn't, and okay. I don't know about Boundary Ridge too. No. And this fence is in Boundary Ridge. Two. <laughs> it's all on the states or two. Mm. So we're boundary, we're saying boundary ridge one does have a functioning HOA, but that's not where the fence is. No, it's on boundary ridge two. Estates and two. And they have no functioning HOA. Is that what we're? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, here's. Hey, John Wong, do you know if the um, boundary ridge one and two and boundary ridge estates HOAs are kind of consolidated into one body of management? Are are you asking? Are they? No. I don't know. Yeah. Did you know? I, I I don't think so. I do know that 
our meeting is coming up, so there's a near term. I, I think it makes sense to do it, to, to put them together. Yeah. But I don't know where, what parts of Boundary Ridge are part. I know that where I live is part of it, as I pay into it, but I don't You're know. You're in where. one, right? Yeah. And I'm in two. Shearwater's on two. That's where a Maybe bunch of that fence yeah. is, too. And I know all the neighbors on that fence line. There's some actually some fence line there that's uh, really falling down, you know? And, yeah, I, and I could just say that I walk the communities, the neighborhoods, pretty much on a regular basis. And I've just talked to a lot of probably your neighbors yeah. on Shearwater. And, you know, without overgeneralizing, they're all pretty much ready to to take action almost is what i'm hearing from them but right. they're asking what you know can we can we not what's the sra's responsibility who you know so i think of the options that i see on the screen i think option two would be um i wouldn't say assigns it but i would say that we have a meeting together with the um the hoas and or HOA, if it's just one that's functioning and discuss it. Because I think from what I hear just anecdotally from people is they want something done too. Yeah, so, so Dan, just off the top of your head to replace to replace that fence, is I that- I have two different prices. One was 36,000, the other was 30,000. Holy cow. Yeah, they're not cheap. Split rail is expensive. It's a long fence, yeah. And Cedar's expensive these days. So. Yeah. And Dan, from the center line of the road to the fence, when we went out and measured it, where was it? Yeah, it was just inside. It's it's kind of it's kind of strange how that that works. It it, it varies, but the fence is not is not within the uh, the road right the, away. Right. Also, almost all of those properties, those for which I could find property markers, are on the other side of the fence. It can be as close as ten inches, and as far as two feet or a little bit more. The fence, most of it that you see, when you look out here directly across the street, almost all of that fence that you see, I would say 600 feet of it, is not on the property, you know, on the uh, residence property. So, just going from the plats, we did some measuring not too long ago. And so, I don't know that. Steve, where did you come up with the location of the fence? as related to the plat and the property. So is that just well, as I, a assumption or did you guys go out and measure like Dan did? Yeah, we went out and measured um, and it does, it does exactly what Dan says. It goes back and forth across the green belt line. But the green belt is not clearly a common area. Depending on where you are. So if you're further up toward the intersection, wow. it's complicated. Yeah. It gets complicated. That's, that's why nothing's happened with that. Exactly. So they, they at the repair here could be a because it's so visible in this community that fence, right? It's yeah. at, right at the corner there. Maybe this is a joint effort. So I do agree that the next step is to meet with the Boundary Ridge HOA to have a discussion about what to do here. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a, a Boundary Ridge 2 uh, leader in the HOA? Yeah, but I no. decided to go it's, for that. <laughs> the, other, the other problem, the problem of merging, you can't, merging them legally is going to be a very long and difficult process. You have to get some kind of collaborative operation agreement among the, the three, because you have to change the CCNRs of each neighborhood and all that in, to actually create CCNRs. Even though we share, we share a uh, common stormwater system and uh, all that other good stuff. Yeah. I know what you're going to get when you talk to the Boundary uh, Ridge 2 people that live on the edge where that fence is, because I've talked to them all. They're all that. Their, folks, their primary focus is water coming into their, their, their lawns are swamps right now. And that the ditch along that road cannot handle the water that's okay. coming in when it comes to severe rainfall. Yeah. So they're going to get hit that. That's the number one priority. The fence, I've never heard anybody bring the fence up. I have. Uh, okay. So I will walk on the, the road a lot. So, but just oh, to gonna move make, things along, I'm going to make a motion that we have a meeting with all the stakeholders regarding 
the defense to to determine a community-wide plan to deal with it. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. And uh, all those in favor? I all those opposed. Okay, we have consent. Okay. And finally, Steve. The I'm last sorry, one Jeff. is. I'm sorry, Jeff. This is Lori. I saw um, two people raise their hand to second that motion. Could you tell me who Doug, officially? Doug was. Uh, Doug made so, the motion, and then no, Steve made the motion, and Doug seconded. Doug you seconded. Sorry. <coughs> Steve made the motion. Doug seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> the last is we get multiple requests to into the office for uh, recommendations about people who provide services, building services, landscaping services, handyman services, and so on. Um, there is a list, an informal list, for which there are no criteria the statement is always we don't we can't rec we don't recommend anybody but here are some people who have worked in Semiamu. <clears throat> this seems relatively unsatisfactory and so for the reasons laid out in the document we are proposing that we create a list of service providers who wish to work in Semiamu and that to be on the list they would sign an agreement that says they will follow the rules that we have for service providers. This would allow us to be sure that people on the list got the access to the rules, that they were notified of updates and changes in the rules, and that, they, that we have on file their promise to follow the rules and that would make enforcement of the rules uh, significantly easier. It, and, and it would not be a recommendation. Anyone who was willing to provide the necessary information and sign the promise would be on the list. The list would need to be monitored and updated annually, probably. So there would be some work associated with it, but we believe, the committee believes that the value in creating a, at least an incentive for contractors to be in touch with the office, to, to read, or at least know that the rules exist and uh, would be strong enough to, um, justify the work necessary. The biggest problem would be that to implement this is, would require more resources than the office has right now. And I, we believe that it would be necessary to get this up and running it, this year, it would be necessary to hire some temporary help to you know, call places, make the list, get the documents made, get people signed up, and, and that, that's Steve, um, uh, I mentioned this to Doug about two months ago. Why couldn't we turn this into an income opportunity for the board? So in other words, they, we, put their, we put a services directory on the, um, on the uh, website. They have to comply with a set of standards and then they have to pay an annual fee to be on, uh, on like, a, like an advertising page. Mm -hmm. That would cover the cost of any temporary, um, you know, uh, people that we have to uh, uh, pay in order to handle the administrative. Mm -hmm. the, the question, the concern I have with that is uh, that sort of suggests that we are recommending a service provider and then if, I think I sorry just for just let me do just a second if I, if I might I think it has the opposite effect because they're 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 taking out an advertisement on our on a on a the SRA association page to communicate with potential homeowners and they're all the only thing they're vetted on is that 
they they're agreeing to the rules. follow the rules. The only problem I could see is potentially then that we, if they do some crappy work at somebody at a person's uh, residence place, then we could be somehow, uh, you know, not culpable legally, but somehow, you know, uh, because we had them on this so, list. Of so so I, I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, we've actually talked about this in the communications committee as it relates to, and it sort of relates to the newsletter concept where advertising would be allowed on the newsletter in the newsletter to raise some revenue. I know, David, you've had some experience doing that. So that that could be a nice project or at least uh, a topic. Yeah, we could put a review site. We could, <laughs> we could tag it with a review site, too, uh, with Sammy Yama residents saying, I had a great experience with X. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm speaking from experience, we have had people advertise with our newsletter, and it's a good source of revenue. We also have tried a preferred vendor list, and that met with not as much success because of what Jeff just was mentioning is that if by any, even by putting any disclaimer in there that we are not endorsing these people, it would always come back to staff and the organization that if somebody had a bad experience, it was the result of, it was our fault. Right. Uh, so you have to be very careful there. The other thing is punitive. If, if you were to do this, I would say you'd have to have a substantial buy-in from those vendors and you would have some kind of punitive action if they did not comply. So that you would say, I'm sorry, you're done. You're out of here. You, that was the second offense. You, we, you're out the, off the list. See you later. It's a good it's, idea. It's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah. I just think that uh, this is one of those things that it's a nice to have, but right now we don't have the resources nor the time uh, to really bring it to fruition. And maybe what we should do is table this till after the first of the year when we're doing more work on our website and perhaps that could fall within in them and we could make a decision whether it's the right or wrong decision yeah i was going to suggest the same thing so yeah i think that's a good let's table it and bring it back for discussion steve do you have anything else at asc um the only other question which ties in with this the issue that was brought up the, in the public forum and now is i if we had any feedback on the request to the developer for Carnoustie to enforce the viol the ongoing violation of the buffer that we brought to the board a couple months ago? Yes, I had a conversation with Tony Gill um, probably a week ago. Um, had uh, followed up on some email uh, correspondence that I had with him that included that one and, and one on the bioswale. And he told me that he was currently speaking with his attorney about that. Mm -hmm. I told him that I would get back in touch with him um, because there was two, two issues that I got a hold of him on. One was that, um, and as far as addressing the rest of his, as declarant, the rest of the HOA and him being the first line of defense, and that some of his members were not, um, uh, so to say, recognizing SRA's authority. And uh, so he's, that, that's the one he said, I'm, I'm speaking with my attorney about that right now. So I'll follow up with him as far as what was, what was the result of the conversations with his attorney. Um, it, it, the tone of voice was not positive. Um, I know we had met with Tony before and he was, that looked as though that he was going to be taking on that responsibility. Um, I did mention the, we, we were wanting to release monies that we have in a trust account for the uh, reconstruction and repair and maintenance of the bioswill, of which he was very much interested in speaking with Dan and Leroy with the repairs he wanted to send his guys and look at when we started that on Graydon Hillside. Um, but that that is another issue that uh, we've lost access to that because of uh, the person that gave us that information is now selling the lots and not wanting to give us that permission back. So yes, Steve, there were, I had some conversation with Tony. I will get back with him again this next week. I told him I would follow up, uh, but um, other than saying he's spoken to his lawyer, that's as far as we've gotten with that. So this brings up the issue that we don't really have clarity about when the SRA steps in if an NHOA 
fails to in its enforcement requirements. And we need we're we're reaching the point where we need clarity. We've got now two active NHOAs, both run by developers that are not doing a very good job of enforcing their own CCNRs. And we don't really have a clear understanding of when we step in. Do, do we have fining ability? I think those are subject to SRA. Yeah, but I think that's part of his question, right? Is when do we actually then step in and administer these fines if that's the case? And Richard's, he's, we've got lots of stuff from Richard on this. I mean, reams of stuff. I mean, I'm sure there's something in there, right? That we could read. In the term that we can solve. Um, yeah, I, I would think so. Let's, um, let's re that. revisit See, Revisit, because I know he prepared a lot of documents for us on that particular issue. Okay, anything else, Steve? Nope, thank you. Okay, the next is uh, continuing business and voting. Do we have anything there, David? Yes, we need to, uh, this board needs a treasurer. No, that's kind of the next. So we got new business. I think that's the next. I, I can't, yeah. so I can't, sorry. Yeah, so the yeah. next is like new, business, computers being new business, which is the appointment of a treasurer. Yes. yes. There we go, yes. So, um, so we, we've gone around about that. And as a matter of fact, back in November of this year, I was speaking to Lori, I saw, um, a uh, resolution passed by the board where even the president could appoint and didn't even have to be a board member could appoint a uh, board officer as such as treasurer. And I guess at some point you must have been looking for someone with those um, those qualifications. So we have had some discussions, uh, Jeff, Doug and I, what is the process for selecting officers? Um, and generally, the way it works is that the board of directors has an election. There's a nomination yeah. made, could be multiple nominations. The chair recognizes the name nominations, closes them, and then votes. Well, I think the way, Doug, Doug, of course, Doug's on the, on the call, but I just re recall that it was Doug would ask for if there were any uh, nominations or people that were interested to put their name forward, and then we had a yeah. simple vote yeah. uh, in the board and it was pretty simple and straightforward. So I guess, Doug, I, um, as presiding officer, then I'll follow your lead um, and then just ask in the room. Yeah, I would, I would uh, uh, nominate uh, Jim Fitzsimmons to be treasurer and ask for your support in that nomination. Okay, so are there any other nominations? Barring no other nominations, um, we can vote. So all those in favor of having Jeff Fitzsimmons as our treasurer, raise your hand. So, all the, so we have unanimous consent. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for stepping forward. So, so Jim, you have a lot of support. You've been not only at David, but there's a, a very talented. So committee. then the other thing we need to do is um, the, the bureaucracy of it. We need to actually prepare a resolution. Um, so we can officially uh, the treasurer and for signing bank uh, documents and so on. So I guess that can be done. After, after meeting. the meeting, yep, yeah. no doubt. It's, um, but I, I believe that the thing that needs to be done here is what we have up before everybody departs is that um, to accept this resolution, you will vote on that. Okay. And, and now that we have a treasurer's name we can put there. Yeah, uh, well, it's not there yet. So do we want to accept this yeah. as it is? Yeah, I, I, I believe that you just, since okay. you've, you've just nominated Ms. Treasurer, now that this, this resolution, um, Semiomic Association Board Resolution 2022-06-2201, resolution for banking authorization, do we have a motion to accept? I make the motion to accept. So Jane has made the motion to accept. Is there a second? John Wong John has seconded. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay, so we have a consent, unanimous consent. So the resolution is accepted. Uh, the next is executive session. Do we have anything for executive session? Hey, uh, Jeff, I have one thing I just would like to bring up that isn't um, in our new business list here. And that um, is, um, there is going to have to be a discussion as to how we get permanent 
access to the uh, Drayton Hillside bioswales. And I just want the board to be aware of that because it's something that we may have to really kind of dig down and, and uh, figure out what, what we're gonna do. And it's gonna be part of our budgeting process for next year because it doesn't look like we may have yep. be able to maintain the lot access yep. and- What's happening with the lot? I thought that coming in through that lot, we had some- it's being sold. Um, yeah, and so we've lost that. We've now. lost the access because it's going down through the middle of the lot. Lot one, there is a utility oh. easement, but we know that we have a owner that is less than agreeable to allowing what is allowed in our covenants to access that bioswell. It's just, do we want to fight with somebody? Yeah. But this is exactly to John's point earlier. These are the uh, objectives and, and discussion that we need to have around the budget. Um, and so it's good that you brought that up, Doug, because it's, yeah. it's relevant. So, okay. Um, barring nothing else, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doug. Thanks, Matt. Steve, thanks for joining. Hey, good job, Jeff. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you. And I think Jim and John, usually our meetings, and this is a great quick one, usually they're five or six hours. Terrible way to sell stuff, man. You know that resolution? Yeah, you know, I got hold off on that one. So, John, I'd like to get you involved uh, in the communications committee.